Welcome everyone to our panel on how to build a more sustainable business. While the sustainability movement has been gaining ground for years, we've really seen an uptick in the past too, as people are craving more healthier environments that are better for the earth. We are very lucky today to have four designers who are all focused on sustainability, maybe a little obsessed, but they approach the category from different angles. Moderating today is Nancy Fire. With over 30 years of experience, Nancy was formerly the design director for HGTV and HGTV Home, and re recently launched her latest endeavor, Nancy Fire Designs, a certified green leader of the Sustainable Furnishings Council, as well as a board member. Nancy encompasses all aspects of sustainable home furnishings. She's co-founder of New York-based Design Works International, now in its 35th year in business, creating textile art, graphics, digital fabric printing, and trend consulting with a focus on sustainable design. Also on our panel today is Kelly Ellis. Kelly is an acclaimed celebrity artist and designer integrating antiques into residential and hospitality venues for the past 25 years. And she devised the innovative Design Psychology Coach Program. Kelly currently resides in Barcelona as the Vice President of Global Industry Relations for Renati, which creates online tools for antiques and art dealers. Laura Hodges is the name behind Laura Hodges Studio, a boutique design firm located in the Baltimore, Washington DC area, which focuses on creating beautiful spaces that are tailored and eclectic. Laura was named a Next Wave Designer by House Beautiful, a Top 20 Designer by in, for 2020 by Sotheby's Home, and a Lux Red Award recipient for Best Contemporary Modern Space. She is also a Brand Ambassador for the Sustainable Furnishings Council. And also is uh, Pantilla Pataraprasit, the CEO of Sabai Design, a sustainable furniture company creating a circular model to reduce the industry's impact on the environment and make conscious living more accessible. Mantilla is a graduate of Columbia University and NYU School of Law and was recognized by Inc.'s Female Founders 100. She is passionate about all things sustainable. So that's our panel. Uh, I will drop their email addresses into the chat. So in case anyone watching wants to follow up with them afterwards with questions or comments, can feel free to do so. But panel, thank you so much for your time today. I'm very excited to hear what you have to say about sustainability. And with that, I will pass the baton over to Nancy. Thank you so much, Andrea, and good, good afternoon, everybody. Thanks for joining. Um, I am so, I'm in awe of all of you. So I'm so happy that you were able to join the panel. Um, a little bit about me four years ago, I changed my intent to educate myself on a more sustainable lifestyle. Since that time, I became a green leader and then I became a green leader board member, which is, has been amazing for me. Um, I've worked at High Point uh, IMC with sustainable stories, um, creating vignettes and also educational programs. And last fall, I did a uh, products with purpose um, and Kelly was on my panel. And it was really wonderful because what we did is we talked about sustainability, but in the audience, there were makers and we really collaborated. So I'm just honored to have all of you today. Um, this is a diverse panel of creative thinkers, especially when it comes to sustainability. But a special thank you to Andrea and the Designers Today team for sponsoring this mindful discussion and recognizing the importance of building a more sustainable business as all of you have. So by making small changes to your lifestyle and business, you can reduce your carbon footprint and help to tackle these very important issues that we're gonna talk about today. So uh, Pantilla, I'm gonna start with you. And the reason being is, um, I hope you don't mind me saying this, but you're 28 years old, you're incredible, you're on the SFC board with me and your vision for the future, my kids are, 27 and 29. And what you bring to the table for me personally is really what the concerns of the future are. And you've been amazing. So at 28 years old, you're the CEO of Sabai. Did I say that right? Sabai, yes. a branded design group that creates curated collections of sustainable furniture 
with a company in High Point, North Carolina. So you're doing things local and domestically, which I think is phenomenal. Tell us about your mission and how your company is at the forefront of sustainable design through your wood substrates, your fabrics, your metal that you use in your designs. Tell us your story. Yeah, happy to. Thank you so much for that, that introduction. Um, so for Sabai and for myself, the mission was really around um, making sustainable living more accessible. And so recognizing that I'm part of a generation that cares about sustainability and buying sustainable products, but a lot of the time sustainable products, especially when it comes to the home industry and furniture, isn't available to those customers. And so essentially Absolutely. bridging that gap um, and creating products that are accessible. And then also just rethinking, you know, once I started digging more into the industry and the impact that it does have, rethinking the model for creating products from the onset, whether that's from the material side, the manufacturing side, but then also creating a model to think about how we addressed waste um, and circularity as well. So building the products and designing the products so that, you know, they're using those materials and creating a supply chain that's sustainable, but also designing for repair programs, replacement programs to really mitigate the amount of turnover and waste that's generated. Over 12 million tons of furniture waste ends up in landfills every year in the U.S. And so creating a model that takes that into account. And then also in addition to those types of programs, resale programs as well. I live in New York, where I see furniture waste left on the curb all the time. And so thinking about how you to create solutions to really mitigate that and make sure that people never opt for that. And so creating a resale channel to make sure that our products don't end up in landfills as well. It's pretty incredible. Can you remind us um, how old is the company? Um, we launched July of 2019. So 2019. So right prior to the pandemic. Exactly. Do you feel that through the pandemic, people found you because they were really more conscious of like their homes and what they were trying to do and update and care more about the environment? Did you see a surge of people like connecting with you? Definitely. I mean, I think that, you know, it would, the timing was actually very ideal for us in terms of both, um, you know, the, the surge in the home industry, people were home, they wanted to update their spaces. Um, people more and more have been focused on buying sustainable products. And so the convergence of that worked out really well. At the same time, we've also set up our supply chain to be very differentiated. So using products that other industry players might not be using. So less um, competition in that, in the material space there, but also to be domestic. So we were essentially insulated from a lot of the supply chain shocks and disruptions that we saw. And so that was also great that way. But I think in terms of updating spaces, that's been really exciting to see as well. I think that the demographic that we speak to specifically is a bit younger. And I'd say that, you know, maybe 20 years ago, people within that demographic didn't care as much what their home spaces looked like because, you know, they were spending less time in their homes and interior design was more reserved for people later on in their lives, whether that's from an affordability standpoint or just time. But I think it's, it's exciting to see in the younger demographic how much more of a focus there's been on, you know, whether that's because people are working from home and spending more time in their spaces, but also sharing their spaces, getting more invested in building um, Absolutely. spaces that they feel excited about. Yeah. So that's also, I think those three um, trends that we've seen have really put us in an exciting position. Absolutely, and there's so much content out there now about home and, and redecorating and DIY and recycling and upcycling. So I think that those keywords and those buzzwords, if you use them online too, people search for that and they, and they come up to your company, which is really fantastic. So thanks again for joining us today. I'm gonna to jump to Laura. Um, good morning or good afternoon, really. As an interior designer, sustainability is truly at the forefront of your practice, as we spoke about, which I was incredibly impressed with. You seamlessly incorporated all aspects into your work. We spoke about donating, building materials, vintage, reclaimed, artisan. Can you elaborate on these practices and how you, over the years, have incorporated them into your design, personal lifestyle, and your business lifestyle? Yeah, definitely. So, I mean, you know, our view of sustainability really starts from the very beginning. So um, if we can, we're working with the architect on, you know, where the house is being sited, what direction it's facing so we can maximize natural light and views and that sort of thing, cuts back on electricity. 
We're talking to them about, um, you know, so if it's a renovation, of course, we're talking about um, donating materials, building materials, reusing as much as possible. Okay. So, you know, we set up um, pickups with, so we have a local place here called Second Chance, and I'm sure that there's, you know, yeah, similar sort of places all over the country um, that will take building materials. And so, you know, we can donate doors, appliances, cabinetry, toilets, sinks, pretty much anything um, that's in, you know, usable condition, of course, or easily repaired. And then, um, and then it's actually the materials that we're using. We're making sure that things are, you know, low or no VOC in terms of the paints and finishes, um, flooring and that sort of thing. And then we're looking at vintage pieces first with our sourcing. We start first with vintage and antiques. Um, even just plain old secondhand is also, you know, Absolutely. a viable option. Uh, Reupholstering what the client already has, refinishing what the client already has. Um, and then from there, we try to design furniture, have it made locally if we can. We work with a fantastic maker here um, in Maryland, and they they actually source a lot of naturally felled trees. So we can make some really fantastic solid wood furniture from, you know, black walnut to white oak, ash, anything that's, you know, local to this area. And that's fantastic. Um, plus, we get to design furniture, which is always a lot of fun. Um, and then we're looking at uh, if it's newly made pieces, you know, we're looking at where the pieces are being sourced from. So can we source locally? Can we source from vendors who are making things in this country, hopefully, or at least using responsibly sourced materials, woods, and um, the, the fabrics are not necessarily, um, you know, like cotton isn't necessarily good for the environment, but you can have organically, you know, grown cotton. And there's also, there's a lot, there's a lot that goes into it. But then we also take it, a lot of our projects, we actually go all the way through to you know, plates and glasses and silverware and bedding. And so we're taking it all the way through the lifestyle as well. So we may be talking to our clients about, do they want bamboo toothbrushes? Do they want natural deodorant? <laughs> do they want, um, you know, linens that are um, that are all organic as well. So we we kind of take it all the way through like a turnkey project for them and sort of try to help them with their lifestyle to be more sustainable as well. You're incredible, really. I love, <laughs> love the one stop sustainable story because it's really important today and you're seeing it through from beginning to end. Are you familiar with the Good Future Design Alliance? Yes. Out in, okay, great. Because I think I'm opening a chapter in New York and oh, fantastic. probably do one by you. Sure. Like, well, we're going to offline about that because yeah, I'm meeting them in June for my second meeting. And I would love to have you as a chapter person. Yeah. Just because you're, you're okay. you are walking the walk and talking the talk at this point. So thank you so much. I'm, I'm telling you all that this panel is so impressive. And my friend Kelly, who was on our panel at High Point. Um, wow. I mean, you are living in Barcelona. You are doing such exciting things. And I just really want the world to understand what it is you're doing because um, you're bringing a lot into the antique world, which is very important today. Um, it's sort of a rebirth uh, because people are waking up again and realizing this is a great way to be sustainable, right? So living overseas in Barcelona, we discussed how many of your clients, and I quote you, have a deep appreciation for history and the grand perspective. So the question I have for you is, can you tell us how you help tell the story with these clients that really want to mix old and new because, you know, the substrates, the outdoors of these homes, these apartments that you're doing is so fabulous. There's so much history. And you go inside this history, but I know you're kind of mod and like there's this mod antique mix. So can you tell us a little bit about that story? Yeah, it's really interesting. Well, first of all, thank you, ladies. So wonderful to meet you. I'm super impressed already can't wait to discuss everything <laughs> offline with both of you i'm very excited <laughs> um yeah it's very interesting because as, as you can imagine like you said the bones here are already what we're constantly trying to recreate right like yes. having that rich history look and people love that um to have the the walls and the spaces look old and we've through for years tried to create that and it's the reverse here so there is a deep 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 appreciation already for antiques here because we're talking about, you know, it's, it's a joke to say something's 100 years old. It's a joke to say something 200 years old. <laughs> like, haha, you know, of course, of course it is. Show me something that's 900 years old. Now we're talking about an antique, yeah. you know, and um, it's, it's very, it's, it's so commonplace here. I was thinking of you, Laura, and what you just said is that um, each neighborhood, each little barrio here in the city has a night 
where you can put your furniture that you no longer want out in front on your street and people just exchange. And they just, they just take what you need. Um, and then there's salvage that will come and pick up. And then there's one place, an antique market that has been around for 800 years where you can go and pick up the pieces that you need or want, be it tiles, be it door frames, fireplace frames, lighting, whatever. But if you happen to be out and you see something that you want to exchange, you just take it. And it's, it's like, I've never seen that before in my life. I've never, I can't even imagine, you know, in where I'm from in the state, Southern California, to see something like that. And you that's know? been going on for a while, I'm assuming. Oh yeah, this is not new. This is not a new program. It's just incredible to me. So that's how much they value an antique piece, mm -hmm. right? So there is, there is this, you know, um, where there's this beautiful chair and there's some provenance. Sometimes there's a story attached. I never knew what the pieces of paper were attached to this, to That's the pieces amazing. to tell you the story. Yeah. I mean, I'm just, I have this new appreciation for um, the antique world, even though I'm in the middle of it, because I'm actually seeing people do something very, very different that I've never seen before. Mm -hmm. So it's, it's also, in, I'm getting enlightened at the same time. But as far as the clients go, um, it's really interesting because they already have these uh, surroundings that are an antique like, and they want to mix mod into it, but they want to be sustainable. That is so, so important. So like Laura, we're finding that we're putting modern fabrics on um, older frames or sort of switching things up in a way that's different to, to give it a little new edge, new spice. But, it, but they don't want to lose the integrity of these pieces. And I, I can't appreciate that more. You know, it's just, it's been incredible. That's wonderful. And, you know, I just got back from Amsterdam on Monday. And I have to say, I got the same vibe when I'm, it's my third time there. My daughter's living there. And um, just everything is so magical because the antiques and the, they're not, the non-waste and the minimalism, but yet everything is so beautiful, but simple. I'm just, I know I'm in awe. I can't wait to come back. And next time I'm coming to visit you and doing that flea market with you. So yes. um, Pantilla, you're up next. We both sit on the SFC, Sustainable Furnishings Council Board in High Point, North Carolina, where you are the youngest member of the team. Tell us why you feel it's important for your company to be a member and what you have gained from being a member and sitting on the board. And do you feel that this has helped you in your business learning different aspects of elements of sustainability that you really had no idea prior? Definitely. I mean, so I joined the board January of this year, and it was essentially a no-brainer. And like when I was asked to join to you know move forward with it, I think that as much as we're doing on our end to try to make an impact and influence the industry, it is such a large industry. There are so many different types of companies and people participating in it that to make more of an impact, it just requires collaboration and working with other um, players within the space. And so, you know. I, that was really the, the driving force behind joining. I would say that it's also been an amazing experience so far. I think I'm extremely excited to get more and more into the strategic planning around, you know, how do we think about influencing the industry and pushing the industry to do even more and how the SFC can be a part of that. I think the working groups that we facilitate are amazing. It drives, I think I've been really pleasantly surprised, not surprised, but just, um, very happy with the working groups that I've been part, a part of to see how much different companies that are essentially in some ways competitors are open to sharing practices with each other to push the industry forward. And I think that's extremely important. It's such a large space. Um, so that, that's that been really exciting for me. I think, I, I mean, I personally have also learned a lot about, you know, different, whether it's packaging or circularity practices and things like that from other people who are talking to other partners or looking at other options within those working groups that we've either considered or implemented for us by ourselves. Yeah, it's pretty enlightening when you are amongst others that really have the same mindset as you. They might be in a similar um, business, but like you said, like packaging, because that's really an important part right now. Like everyone could get step one, two, and three down, but when you don't have the packaging down, it's sort of like a mute point. So um, I'm glad. I'm so glad. And thank you again for being a part of the SFC and we're happy to have you. So this segues into Laura, because you're a brand ambassador for the SFC, right? right. Um, where I'm a board member and so is Pantilla. So what, what does that mean for you? And what does it mean for your business? Do you feel that you've gotten clients because 
because you're a member of this organization or do you feel you've just been enlightened by the education that you know you've received from being a member um i think it's the, the latter of the two i like to i like i would like to think that our clients are interested in all this sort of thing and i would say though that it's sort of like the icing on the cake i kind of compare it to going out to a fabulous meal and then being told at the end of it that it was really good for you it was all sourced locally from organic farms and everybody's you know treated fairly and paid fairly and so but ultimately they want the really good meal they want the fantastic experience they right. want luxury and they want you know the beautiful design and all that sort of thing and it's great that all the rest of it is there too they're very happy that we're sustainable they're very they're very happy that that's important to us and so with the sfc what's really great um, for me is being able to um, be part of a larger community where it's also really important and you know i also did the green leader thing and so i love being able to tell our clients that not only um, do we talk about these things and, and talk to them about it, but we are actively trying to stay at the forefront of what's happening next in the industry, learning about new brands, and that it's 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 an ongoing lesson. It's it's not just okay, I learned about it and now I'm done, right? <laughs> it's just kind of like there's always innovations, there's always new things to learn, and uh, I think that's really interesting. It can be a little bit um, intimidating sometimes if you're like trying to find something new that hasn't been done before but everything it feels like almost everything within the green industry in terms of building and that sort of thing right. is new you know all the innovations are new and a lot of these things have not been tested um yet or they're still relatively new five ten fifteen years kind of thing so um i love being part of that industry though that is always innovating and trying to figure out how to do things better and we love having ambassadors like yourself who will really walk the walk and talk the talk because that's really important to us. You know, it's interesting what you said about newness. I just read every day I'm reading something else. And yesterday, Stella McCartney, who I absolutely adore because she's been doing sustainable everything since she started her business, um, just came out for you know, retail for bags made of mushroom, mushroom fiber. So we're seeing more and more of these things every day, whether it's in home or fashion, it's just, you know, it's, it's enlightening to see. Um, so Kelly, preservation of history. I always come back to you for this. Your vision with Renati the, and your VP of Global Industry Relations, the first multi-marketplace tool created specifically for dealers and sellers of one of a kind, which is so cool. I love the phrase unlocking the global stock of art, vintage and, ant and antiques. Let's talk about your preservation of history through th through Renati. How, how how is that connection working? It's incredible. Um, you know, it's funny because our first product, as you mentioned, was to help dealers sell better, right? To sell online better. And just like you, Pintilla, um, you know, during the last few years, it was just incredible for us because dealers didn't have the vehicles to go out and sell in person, and they realized, oh my gosh, I need to be online. And so we were able to help them do that better. And we're constantly creating tools. And I have designers, you know, often say to me, um, you know, how I love sourcing in antiques. I love sourcing this. How can you help me? And, I'm, and I tell them, we are helping the dealers get in front of you. Mm -hmm. That is our goal, right? Because all three of us here love to source, whether it be one of a kinds, whether it be right secondhand antiques, you know, you're, you kind of have something in your mind and you start searching online. That's one of the first things that we do um, to get inspiration and or buy. And so we are just helping those dealers who have these incredible pieces, who painstakingly go and find them and trek around the globe to do so, sell them online better and get them in front of you in the best way possible. We are creating some tools for designers as well because I would be extremely remiss if I didn't. <laughs> being a designer myself and um, love and loving using antiques and um, vintage pieces in my designs always um, it was it was just a no-brainer for me to be involved and sort of marry the two together as, as much as possible in a tech way so like part two of that question is the, i love the concept that you literally direct the dealers on what's hot and trends right um in home decor so they can arrange their spaces better to fit um, what designers are looking for. Just take a minute and talk about that too, because I think that's really the key. Like you're educating them on what we're looking for. It's huge um, I, because they, they love what they do. They love to go and pick. They love to go get dirty. They love to go into warehouses. But then when they have the item, what you'll see, and, and designers know this, you have to really 
search and you really have to find those those people that know how to do their photography that know how to set up a vignette that know how to relay the information to you as a designer the way you want to see it right because we're so um aesthetic we are we we know what's going to catch our eye right when you're shopping and you're doing your searching and but they don't and so I love going through and giving them the trends. Um, a lot of what Pantilla was talking about <clears throat> as far as some of the natural things that are that are appealing to, um, to designers right now or some of the brown wood tones that are back and why we love them. And so I love to share with our dealers. They are just sponges when they want to hear exactly what we're looking for because we are some of their best clients and repeat clients, you know, the, when they start developing those relationships with the designers, they're super happy because they know um, that we, we have a keen eye and we're looking for certain things and they would love to show us those things first, but they have to do it in a way that we're going to be interested. So I, sharing that information with the dealers has been fantastic. And the dealers are great because, you know, they're so quirky and, and, and they, they have love for finding these beautiful pieces. But for you to help them become a little bit more commercial, you know, you're connecting the dots, you're putting these like antique artisans together with designers. So that's fabulous. I'm so excited to see what Renati does next. So thank you for that. Uh, Pantella, back to you. Um, what's next for your company? When we last spoke, you mentioned venturing into coffee tables um, that are designed from reclaimed wood and recycled steel. Can you tell us a little bit about about the process of designing a new sustainable product and the research you need to do in order to make sure the product truly is sustainable. You also talked about hemp as possibly a new fabric going forward. Yes, definitely. Um, so the coffee tables were actually, that's gonna be our first additional product line outside of our seating line, which we're coming out with next month. And I find the product design process it, such a fun process. Um, you know, for us, we do, there's so many different considerations, whether it's sustainability on the materials front, sustainability in terms of designing for repair and resale. Um, and then also on the customer side, really understanding what they like to use their products for and what they're looking for in terms, whether it's trends, um, like Kelly was talking about, or, you know, the use of it itself. And so we do a lot of pulling on our Instagram or survey um, giveaway surveys, for example, where we ask customers, you know, not only what color wood do you like, what color legs do you like, but also, you know, what do you actually use, for example, a coffee table for? Is it for putting coffee table books? Is it for board games? Is it for eating? Things like that. And so that's a really fun part in terms of the product design process. But then in terms of sustainability on the material side, we're incredibly excited about that as well. We're using, um, similar to what Laura is saying, actually, in terms of this reclaimed wood from essentially fallen trees within, for this first line from Baltimore, trees that would otherwise be, are cut down because they've fallen or in the way that would otherwise go to landfills and creating a product line for them that doesn't necessarily look like reclaimed wood. And so not, um, you know, pigeonholing it into that demographic. So it's more, that type of material is more accessible to people. Um, and so using that type of material, for the, that'll be you know domestically sourced and produced as well. The legs will be made from recycled steel, also domestically sourced and produced. Um, and then also really focusing on um, the toxicity as well. I think that um, like Laura was talking about the VOC consideration, that's, I, I think people are learning about that more and more in terms of air quality yeah. and the types of chemicals that are often used in furniture products that you know, off gas into our bloodstreams and can be carcinogenic. And so really focusing on the health of um, the products and their interaction with people as well. And then also designing the products. So for our coffee tables, for example, the top and the base, um, we design them to be flat packs so that it's um, easily shipped and assembled, assembled and moved. But then also, you know, if you decided you wanted, because I think young people are so fickle sometimes and like fast furniture. And so thinking about how you design to help them have that kind of fix without contributing to fast furniture. And so you can actually buy a new base from us that's a different color or a new top that's a different color. And so designing so that people can switch out certain parts or repair things if they get damaged um, without having to replace the whole piece. And so designing from the onset so that that process is smooth and easy. I love your thought process. I love that you're really thinking out the growth of your company in a very sustainable and manageable way. So, so thank you for that. 
Laura, this is a perfect segue actually, because um, when we spoke, you talked about naturally felled trees. We spoke about this and you mentioned using trees that naturally fall and reclaim the wood in your projects. I think you just did something similar. Was that an Arc Digest or can you, can you talk about that? Yeah, so um, for the custom furniture that we make, we work with somebody who um, basically every time a tree needs to be cut down, whether they're building a house or, you know, the root system is somehow impeding the sidewalk or something like that, or if a tree literally just falls down, this company goes and takes those trees, they dry them, and then they use them to make furniture and countertops and that sort of thing. Um, the other side of it, though, is, re is using reclaimed wood, and that was a project that we, um, yes, we have in um, uh, Architectural Digest right now, where it was a very big plot of land that had lots of different sort of small outhouse buildings on it. And so we took a lot of that wood, they pulled out in the nails, they sanded it down, and we made custom cabinetry, we made a couple of dining tables and benches, and um, you know, we used some of it for the framing around the windows and casing around doors and anywhere that we could use it basically until we ran out. And it was really, really, really cool to be able to do that because it's sort of like we were using the land to make, because those buildings had been there for a very long time. And so um, being able to, you know, reuse pieces that were literally already there in order to make something else, it, it just felt very, um, I don't know, it just felt like a nice story to be able to tell for the clients. It was, it was like we were preserving the property and not just rebuilding something brand new, you know. Absolutely. Now, did your, when you started to work with these clients, was it their um, idea? Was it yours? Was it a collaboration to do this? It was everybody. Um, it kind of just felt like it's funny because I'm so used to having to talk to people about, you know, sustainability and sort of educate. Um, yeah. And it felt like in this circumstance, because the builders were from the area, um, they knew the property. And so it kind of was just like, well, of course, we're going to do that. There's all these buildings here. Let's use the wood that we have. And also it was right during the middle of the well, I guess the beginning of the pandemic. So labor, uh, lumber rather was increasing in cost. So there was like a, well, here's all this lumber that we already have and, and it's beautiful. Like it was all different types of woods and things. So it kind of felt like everybody wanted to do it, which was really nice. And it was a very much a collaborative effort. It was like, we have all this wood, what can we do with it? And I'm like, well, I'm I'm, I'm happy to design all kinds of things with it. So that's fantastic. A dream project. Yeah, congrats. Yeah, it was a lot of fun. Congratulations on the coverage as well. I mean, you. stories like that we'd love to read. Um, yeah. So yeah, kudos to you for that. So Kelly, you're listening to us about the states and about recycling and about the SFC and all this stuff. Can you give us your perspective on the EU recycling? I understand the antiques part where people want to keep the history going, but do you feel that the, the generations around you, both older and younger, um, care about recycling? Are, are you seeing a different because I know years ago there wasn't any, and I'm wondering now if you see something different where you are. Yes, and first I, I'm, I had uh, SFC FOMO, so I'm taking the Green Leaders Program. Thank you oh, all of you. Yes, you I'm very it. excited. Yes, <laughs> Susan sent me, she's right after we had our panel, she sent me that, so I'm very excited about that. Good. Um, can't wait to join y'all on the other side. Um, <laughs> Uh, yeah, you know what, it's, it, it is a massive initiative here, and I was actually super impressed. Um, I started, my daughter moved here, she's not so your age, Mantilla. Um, I, I, my daughter moved here four years ago, and so I kept coming and visiting, and I was always so impressed about the recycling initiative here. At the end of every street, there are huge recycling containers, glass, paper, plastic, you know, I mean, and it's very specific and people do it and it just comes natural. And in our homes, we separate, you know, and if it, if it comes in a carton and you've got your paper here and your plastic here, you put it in the things and you do it. And it's just, it's second nature for everyone here. It's not, it's not, um, it's not new. It's not a big deal. The city has a huge initiative um, to have locally sourced everything. They will tell you when there's somebody new who's got um, a great initiative, you know, a company, yep, a new company or a new business. Um, vintage clothing as well as vintage furniture is very, very, very big here. Um, it, to, to buy something new um, is almost embarrassing. It's that, it's that far over to the other side, you know, like it, it truly is impressive. So 
when when I go back and forth to the states to here, I can I can see the difference. Um, but you know, you're talking about a population that's so much easier to get a message across to and and affect change. It's a lot easier when you have, you know, manageable amount amounts of people. You can do those things. Um, but it is it is very much a second nature thing here that I that I am grateful for. I'm grateful to be surrounded by because then I can kind of share those things with clients back home because I still design in the states. I still design hospitality in the states. Um, and we use beetle kill woods and we use, you know, Laura, like you're talking about the, the fallen trees and the things. And I love, I love it so much. And I'm learning so much. And of course I'll learn so much more through the green leaders program, <laughs> but, <laughs> but, but I'm also getting that knowledge from here, which just seems to be almost second nature for so many people, which is wonderful to yep. see. Well, it's funny, I guess if I keep going back to Amsterdam, maybe I'll move there too, because my daughter who's Pentilla's age is living there. So there you go. Mm -hmm. um, I know that Andrea wants to come back and ask a few questions. So I think that my time is up and we'd like to invite Andrea to come back and uh, <laughs> chat with us a little bit. This has been wonderful. What I love to, I mean, sustainability has really changed over the last, I mean, I've noticed a change over the last decade or 15 years where back in the day you used to just talk about oh something is made out of recycled something and right. now we're talking about like it's from the forest floor and now it's made into furniture and like also now it's it's passed on to someone else after the person's right. done with it or uh pantilla's company is if you want to change the top you can change the top Every, like everyone's addressing how the consumer is yeah. you know, is, is shopping now and, and what they want so that's that's great but it's been really wonderful you know hearing from from everyone and i love the idea in barcelona of of a, of a night where you can go and and drag out your antiques. I have a friend who uh, lives in the Lincoln Center area of New York, and he, the night before Garbage Day, he has picked up some really great wow. antiques in on the streets of New York. So I think New York maybe needs to coordinate a, a, a night for that. I think that would be really awesome. Instead I, of just throwing it out. I have to tell you, I did that last week with a friend. Oh, you did? <laughs> and there was a piece that was perfect for apartment. I was like, let's, and we, we schlepped it back. So yep, yeah, same. That's so great. Yeah, I, I love that. But I think it could be more coordinated and that'd be that exactly. Exactly. <laughs> But I did have a few questions. So what if, so, so like for people, for designers, interior designers who are maybe, you know, sustainability is like overwhelming or they don't know where to start or the price is too high for budgets or something or clients don't bring up. Is there a tip or something you would suggest, some advice you would give to designers who don't know where to begin? Anyone? I mean, I, 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 I would, I tell all of my friends to really check out SFC because there are so many, there's so much great information on the website. So there's, you know, the, the green initiative, um, who the design, who the uh, manufacturers are that are actually designing green. Um, at every market, there's a list of who you should visit and what they're doing. Um, so, I mean, that's, that's my go-to. Uh, as far as pricing goes, you know, as more companies are doing what they're supposed to, pricing will come down. So that's what I'm seeing, you know, and I think Pentilla could probably speak to that, seeing what, what, how she's working. But um, ladies, what, what, what do you suggest? Any additions to that? I was gonna kick it to Laura, cause I feel like Laura, you, you have your finger on that pulse, you know, as yeah. far as, you know, designers or your clients. And when they say it's too expensive, I'm sure yeah. you have. <laughs> Yeah, I would say that for anybody who is, you know, sort of dipping their toe into it, um, it can be really overwhelming because there's a lot to consider. But I always like to say uh, everybody doing it imperfectly is better than just a few of us doing it perfectly. Right. And so it can just be as simple as starting your sourcing with looking at antiques, cherish, vintage, Renati, <laughs> like anywhere that you can go to try to find something that already exists. And by the way, it's way better for your lead times, right? <laughs> Instead of having to wait 30 weeks for upholstery like we're all doing right now. Uh, if something's already made, you can get it and you're just having to wait for shipping time, right? So, or, and in that regard as well, shipping, when you're searching on all these vendors' websites, you can actually search by radius of where it is. So instead of just saying, I'm gonna ship something from wherever it is in the world, you could say, I'm gonna look for something vintage within a 500 mile radius. And then you've done two things. You're not making something new and you're cutting down on your carbon footprint with your transportation costs, right? So right there, done. You've already accomplished two things and you didn't really even have to 
you know, you didn't have to go off and get your green leader certification, um, which I encourage you to do because it's pretty cool. But, um, you know, there's small steps that you can do. It's just being more thoughtful in your purchasing and not just sort of going to your first retail site that you're used to all the time or your first vendor that you've always worked with for a million years and just or asking those questions when you go to high point you know visit the factories go to the vendors showrooms and ask them about their sustainability initiatives exactly. that's what i do i'm not sure that they like seeing me coming when i ask those questions but um it does get the conversation going and it lets them also know that you're interested and that um it's something that they should be talking about absolutely Wonderful. And since there's so much innovation now in sustainability, is there one thing that's really exciting about you, exciting you now in sustainability, anything on the horizon that you're keeping an eye on or, or waiting for? Uh, I really, go ahead. Sorry. Oh, thank you. I was just going to say, I, I get really excited on the material side. I think being in, you know, the product design and development space, I'm really grateful to get to see a lot of what's out there, what's missing, what's being developed and um, honestly work with those suppliers because like we've talked about, a lot of the materials are very early on. And so working very closely with those suppliers to develop materials that could be suitable, suitable for the industry or for our products. And um, so I think that is a really exciting part. I know we've talked about, you know, different natural materials. For example, hemp is one that I'm really excited about because cotton can be so resource intensive and hemp is a very great alternative that's natural as well. And so getting to be really involved in the material side is something that um, I've, I've really enjoyed. I would agree with that. And I would say that as, um, as a consumer of those products, I love knowing that you guys are at the forefront and looking into all those materials because we don't have any, we don't have choices over those things, right? We have to sort of rely on the makers to um, sort of, you know, innovate in that way. And so it's always exciting to me to see what's going on. I love seeing pieces made up out of recycled plastic. And I think thinking more about the life cycle of a piece rather than just on recycling and um, that sort of thing, because not a lot of things actually get recycled. So I love recycling. I'm like, you know, we throw away one bag of trash a week, we compost, we do all that stuff, but just using less, I think. And then also when you do buy something, thinking about when you're done with it, who's going to use it next? You know, and, and like everything that you guys were talking about, like the circularity of um, the industry. I also am very excited to see the shipping companies. Like obviously we work with um, the antique and the art and the vintage one of kind pieces, but the next component for that is the shipping, right? And especially international. So I am very excited about some of the initiatives coming from some of these worldwide shippers and what they're willing to do to reduce their carbon footprint has been astounding for me. Um, and we're, they're, they're offering up the transparency and offering up their solutions, their own personal solutions and what they can do to change, be it, you know, electric cars or putting things on the ocean rather than flying them or diff different ways, but they really are being thoughtful about it because they know they have to now. Um, to your point, Laura, you know, if you start asking the question, they have to start answering at some point, right? Because you you make, you do all the things you can do to a certain point and then you kind of give it up to industry and hope that they're doing what they can do. And it's so nice to see some of these larger um, companies stepping up. Yeah, absolutely. And I just wanna add about the, the circularity, which is really the crux of everything. So it's cradle to cradle. So being a textile designer and having a textile background, to me, the most exciting thing is seeing fabrics made out of mushroom, okay? Cause it is sustainable. Seeing fabrics that are uh, made out of algae, actually. We're seeing cork now spun into yarn or lighting. So, I mean, there's so much going forward. It's um, on, on the uh, uh, fabric side and textile side that I think that to me is, is the most exciting because I, I touch that every day. That's wonderful. Well, thank you panel so much. It's been such a, an insightful um, uh, panel and I've, I've learned so much and I hope our, uh, our viewers have also learned a lot. Uh, again, thank you, Kelly, uh, Pantilla, and Laura. And thank you so much, Nancy, for moderating. Absolutely. And, yeah, thank you very much for your time today. Thank you. Thanks, everyone. Thank you, Thanks, everyone.